Hello everyone, welcome back to the English Law Channel. So this video I'm going to be uh, looking at pure economic loss um, and uh, negligent statements. So um, economic loss, um, look, I've looked at emotional and sort of psychological injury that arises from witnessing traumatic events. Um, now there's economic loss, so lose, losing money, and that can be consequential on a physical injury. Um, or some physical damage to property that you own, and that is recoverable. So if somebody is wounded because there's a car crash and then suffers some pecuniary loss arising from that, for instance, if he or she is unable to work for a while, then um, th those losses are certainly recoverable. But there is an exception to that, and that's about bringing up children, remember, in wrongful birth cases. McFarlane against Tayside Health Board which I previously mentioned, that a bonny baby was born. But anyway, the birth of, of, of a child is a benison, and therefore you can't um, uh, claim any, any damages on that. But there was a case, Reese, where a, um, a child was born to a woman who was severely disabled and therefore was uh, unable to mother the child properly. So she was able to, to gain damages for um, the, the cost um, consequent on raising this infant. Um, there is an exception to the general rule that um, consequential economic loss is recoverable because the issue of wrongful birth is a highly um, tendentious one uh, because uh, giving birth um, uh, could be regarded as an injury. Sometimes there's tearing involved. It's obviously a little bit of a risk. Um, so if birth isn't considered an injury, then the financial cost of bringing up a child it would be pure economic loss. And that's subject to the far more limiting rules that I'm going to add and break a bit later. So um, old childbirth is painful, so I'm told. I've not birthed anyone myself for reasons for my guess. Um, but the McFarlane rule is um, uh, an exception to the, to the um, usual principle. So pure economic loss. Anyway, there are lots of thorny questions around this. A financial loss, which is not resulting from physical damage to a personal property. That's what pure economic loss is. So you see that there's um, a connection to the um, difference between defect and damage, which I talked about in an earlier video. Uh, if, a if a defective property per se, if it's defect, then that will um, not um, uh, result. Then that will result in financial loss, but it wouldn't be recoverable because defect is not damage. It's not a consequence of damage to the property. To the property, the property was made badly. It came out wrong in the first place. It was a reject. However, if it's made properly and is subsequently damaged, that's different. That's damage rather than defect. So there's Murphy and Brentwood, 1991. That's an important case. And there's as authority that losses, those losses are not recoverable um, in, in uh, English law. However, in certain com common law countries such as Australia and New Zealand, it's different. Um, pure economic loss is not recoverable in most cases um, if it's uh, arising from a negligent act as opposed to a negligent misstatement. And I'll talk more about negligent misstatements later. So um, a lot of time has been given by scholars of tortious behaviour to try to comprehend why there is this um, scarcely logically defensible difference drawn between acts and statements. Um, anyway, and to try and find the... Um, uh, how they can decide whether specific causes of pure financial loss are act causes or statement causes. Because if it's a statement cause, well, that's recoverable, an act cause is not. So um, what types of pure economic loss are recoverable? Rather few. Because remember, generally speaking, a defendant um, is not liable for pure economic loss um, caused by negligent statements well, in the old days. But in 1964, the rules about recovering economic loss have um, evolved. So financial loss that um, is, is due to negligent statements is recoverable, but only if it meets some rather stringent criteria. The principle was laid down in Headley Byrne against Heller, 1964, Capara Industries PLC against Dickman, 1990. That doesn't mean that all foreseeable economic loss is going to be recoverable. The law still takes a very narrow view on this. Um, so it's worth thinking about policy reasons why there are restrictions on the right to recovery of economic loss. And many of these have evolved in some of the cases I'm going to talk about this evening. So the recovery of, of pure economic loss, what are the policy reasons for this? Economic interests are inherently worth less, deserve less protection than physical interests. That's one of the policy reasons. If economic loss is usually recoverable, then the burden on some defendants would just be 
ruinous. Imagine a defendant who, who carelessly causes some pollution and then the whole community is going to sue him. I mean, all business interests are going to suffer a little bit. Does he have to pay out uh, reparatory payments to all of them? He'd be, he'd be bankrupt. There's a general rule against pure, recovering from pure economic loss, and that is straightforward and simple. So claimants can often make up their pure economic loss in other ways without compensation. If you have to shut down your business for a short time, then you'll be able to work longer hours um, on another day. It could be economic sense for potential claimants to insure against possible economic losses that they may sustain, and so then the defendants wouldn't have to compensate them. So take out insurance. Um, allowing pure economic loss to be recovered in tort, that blurs the distinction between tort and contract. Um, the issue of this argument has changed because, of course, the contracts that rise are third parties Act 1999. Prior to that, claimants would sometimes try and, and launch a claim in tort because of the um, rather restrictive rules of privity of contract um, forfended them from suing for breach of contract. There is an instance of this in White and Jones, and Lord Goff in that case said that the legal system would allow claimants in that case to enforce a contract. But English, court, uh, English law doesn't, even after that act. Um, so after the Headley Byrne decision, many people thought the damages for economic loss might be recoverable uh, as for physical damage. But anyway, that didn't happen. So pure economic loss. What about negligent acts? Um, OK, there's a case in Spartan Steel and Alloys Limited against Martin and Co. 1973, a Queen's Bench case. Uh, the defendant was a contractor, was doing some road work and accidentally cut a power cable and that, that was providing electricity to the plaintiff's um, manufactory. Therefore, the factory had to close for 14 hours. The plaintiff's melting works, works had to be closed. So a melt was in progress and the, uh, so the seal, steel was prevented from solidifying, had to be, so had to be take, taken out of the furnace to do that. Anyway, the plaintiff suffered three different kinds of loss. First of all, it, it reduced the value of the metal that had to be removed from the furnace before it solidified. It uh, wrecked the machinery. The profit would have made from the melt was, was not attained. And a profit from four more future melts was not attained because in 14 hours they could have got through four other melts. The Court of Appeal, by majority decision, said that he, they could get the compensation be, could be given for the first two heads of damage, but not the third. So the reduction of the value of the solidified metal melt and the profits that would have been from its sale, those get compensation. The plaintiff was given nothing for the profits and for future melts, um, which could have been processed before the electricity was restored, because that was pure economic loss. It didn't flow from physical damage. Those melts, nothing was damaged to stop that happening. Just the practice couldn't operate for some time. Um, Lord Denning looked at the policy justifications about, um, behind the fact that courts are loath to impose liability for pure economic loss. And he underscored that negligence law is about physical property and damage. Lord Denning said, the risk of economic loss should be suffered by the whole community who suffer the losses, usually many, but comparatively small cases, small losses, rather than on the one pair of shoulders, close quotation. OK, so there's Anne, um, Anne's versus Merton, uh, London Borough Council, 1978, an appellate court decision. So the plaintiffs were le lessees of some apartments and they said they'd suffered physical um, deterioration to the buildings because of the foundations were not deep enough. So they sued in negligence against um, uh, Merton Council on the ground that the neg they negligently failed to inspect the foundations properly. Um, so Lord Wilberforce, he looked at the uh, risk of uh, physical injury and, and he said that and the material physical damage. So he considered the cause of action and then he said, we can leave aside cases of personal injury or damage to, to, or as other properties presenting no difficulty. It is only the damage of the property for which requires con or the, which requires consideration. It can only arise when the state of the building is such that there is a present or imminent danger to health or safety of persons occupying it. Close quotations. So in Murphy and Brentwood District Council 1991, um, this went all the way to the House of Lords and it sat in a constitution of seven. And they said they had to overrule their previous decision at Anne's and they found that a defect in property which causes damage, military thing itself, is not damage for the person of law because it's equivalent to introducing a non-contractual remedy about the building or the, or the inspection of the uh, foundations being fit for purpose. If something's going to be recoverable, then the damage must be to other property. And that was set out in DNF estates against church commissioners. The last thing on this is um, 
A defective property that causes actual physical damage to other property is recoverable, and a defect that causes physical injury to people is also recoverable. But defective property must cause actual physical injury to a person. It can't be just potential injury. The injury's got to take place. In Murphy, which overruled the Anne's case, the House of Lords said it's, it's clear that imminent risk to health and safety of people of defective property is not enough to ground an action in the tort of negligence.